before I go into the text this evening, I think it appropriate to address us and say we should not be discouraged if we look around us and see many empty seats. Um, part of the Lord's working and His grace in the preaching of the Word is um, that He sends the people, He sends the ears. He tells you where to preach, what to preach, as you prepare the sermon, and uh, you preach and you believe like Ezekiel believed that even dry bones can come to life and I think it's easier to believe that God will fill some of these empty seats than to believe that dry bones can live. Um, the reason I give this encouragement is a reminder to myself as we stood and sang uh, my growing up years, I uh, grew up in the Gereformeerde Kerk in Swaizerenike, a very small congregation, and we were about 30 people in the morning service, in the first morning service. And the people on the farming community said, well, we can't go out in the evening because in the evening we need to uh, bring in our, our, our livestock. And so the pastor very wisely suggested, well, why not have two morning services with a coffee break in between? Let's have coffee for an hour and then come to the second service. And for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, it was only the pastor's family, his wife and her, uh, their four children, and our family, my mother, my father, my brother, and I, in all of those services. And uh, let me tell you, if it wasn't for the stamina of that pastor to continue to preach the word, you probably would not have this pastor standing before you this evening. I attended two services on a Sunday, all of my growing up years, and I can testify to the power of God through the preaching of his word. And I encourage you in the same. So, turning to God's Word, the powerful Word of God, in the book of, or the letter of John. 1 John, chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. 
We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he can see cannot love God whom he cannot see. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Our text this evening comes from verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So right after John gives us the section of testing the spirits, holding up to the church the pattern of true teaching, knowing truth from error, how they may discern what the false teachers are saying to them as being false, being untrue, and also seeing the result of that, disunity, unlovingness, he reminds the church again to confirm her commitment, her commitment to Christ. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. We should love one another precisely because love is from God. Love is from God. How is it that we know that we are from God and that we've been born from God? It's when we love when we love in the same way in which God had loved us, you see, by imitation. How is it that God has loved us? God loves us by telling us, you're so wonderful, I just need you, you're so great. That's not what God does. God confronts you in the true state that you are in, in the nature that you are in. Much like a father confronts his children or comes to his children when they're in trouble because of their own sin or their own ignorance, their own dark circumstances. He comes to us and he acknowledges that. He comes to us and he tells us, you're a sinner. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. You're unworthy. You're unholy. And then he deals with that. He transforms us. He takes us from that state of sin and misery, dies for our sins so that the holy God may and can be a God who draws sinners to himself without them being consumed by fire. You see, the righteousness and the wrath of God and the holiness of God should drive him to consume us with fire. Yet the great mystery of God's love declared to us in John chapter 3 and 16, for God so loved the world, God who is perfect, holy, righteous, and just, so loved the world in the grip of sin and death. What moved God to love? What caused him to love the world? You see, the world only caused God grief and anger. Just like Israel caused God anger to be angry at them when they committed the sin with the golden calf. Just like Adam caused God to be angry with him so that he must die for his sins, so that Israel must die for their sins. Remember what God said to Moses? Go down so that my anger may burn hot against them and I consume them. Don't you think God's anger is also against the people in his church? His anger sometimes with his people? Burning hot with anger against you? Against us? Do you think we somehow cheaply escape the wrath of God? How angry do you think God is with you and with me? But then God is not uncontrollable in his anger. He does not wipe you out in an instant. We read in John 3.16, God so loved. God reacts in a way totally opposite from what you would expect him. 
You see, if you and I were in the position of God, if anyone were to treat us even a little bit with disdain, I mean, it's true of us. We can't stand it when people don't show us honor, when they don't treat us exactly how we expect them to treat us. How severe are we in our judgment of people when they don't treat us well? We cut them out of our lives completely. We even see this as husbands put their wives away or wives run away from their husbands or fathers run out on their children. Why do you run out on your children? Because they don't respect me as a father. Why are you divorcing? Your because she's impossible. God, why do you still love your people? Why would you still love them? They committed the sin of idolatry. Even the Corinthian church, we read about them. Idolatry, adultery, strife. Envy, arrogance, pride. All of the things we find in this church even. Here's the grace of God. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. But by the grace of God, He's transformed us by His love. Precisely because He doesn't treat us like murderers. He doesn't treat us like adulterers. He doesn't treat us. He treats us as children. He treats us as children. And so the confidence that we may have is no matter what else we may be, we have the confidence we are sons of God. We are His children. And he has forgiven our sins, cleansed us, taken away completely that which was before, and constitutes us a new creature in Christ. And here's the, the wonderfulness that John is declaring. If you have been constituted a new creature in Christ, if you have been born from God, you are no longer the unloving, hating, sinful, wicked person that you were. God has redeemed your pursuit after sin. He's redeemed that heart of yours, that heart that so desires to do the sin and the wickedness that leads to death. And so transform that heart to say, I'm compelled not by my sinful desire, but the love of God towards me is of greater compulsion for me to do and to react and to live in obedience. And not just regimental obedience, but true, sincere obedience from the heart, moved by the love with which He loved us. What is the love with which he loved us? What is the love with which he loved us? We see in verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. You see, if we're unmoved by the love of God, John says you don't know God. You need to know God. And what does he mean by you need to know God? You need to go to the catechism question eight and just learn all those things and be able to say them all. No. He's saying you need to know God as the God who loves the world, who sent his son. You need to know God as the father in heaven who redeemed you from your sins, who's adopted you into his household, who's made you an heir who's given you a heavenly inheritance because you are part of the family. You need to know God in that way. You need to know God like my children know that I am their father and no other person is their father. 
You need to know that God is your only heavenly father. And you must not insult your heavenly father. By putting your trust in man. By putting your trust in the things of this world. By putting your trust in your bank account. By putting your trust in your work. By putting your trust anywhere except for your heavenly father. It would be insulting. So anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. It makes perfect sense. Anyone who does not know God or does not love does not know God because God is love. And so anyone who claims he knows God must demonstrate that he knows how to love. Because to know God is to know how to love. You can't be an unloving ungrateful person and be known as a Christian who loves God. The, the two don't match up. What do people say about you? What do your brothers and sisters in the church say about you? Well, I know that so-and-so loves me or that I love them. But if people don't see that you love them in the church, your fellow church members, they don't see you loving them, they don't see you praying for them, bearing their burdens with them, if we don't do this for one another, where is the proof of our love for one another? And where is the proof of our love for God even? You see, and that love does not come from our own hearts because that love comes first and foremost from God showing his love to us. The love of God compels me. I am moved by his love for me. My reasoning is not, oh, I just feel so great toward God. Now I'm going to do this. Because what happens if you don't feel so great tomorrow? Then you have an excuse. I don't feel so lucky today, so I'm not going to love. You see, what compels you? Every morning you get up, Jesus' mercy is new every day. God's mercy for you is new every day. Thank you, Lord, for this breath. Thank you for this life. Thank you for another day. I don't deserve another day. Every day you open your eyes, you realize it's another day which is a gift from God. In which I may love him. Because I already know when I open my eyes, he loves me. I know he loves me. And so God loves me. My response immediately is I must love. Are you repulsed by the love of God or does it give you energy for the day? When you're confronted with God's love for you in the new day? Do you go about your day with great energy and zeal? Or do you shrug your shoulders and say, oh, this world is just coming to an end. And, oh, the news. and Oh, this terrible economy. And oh, this terrible government. And, oh, ESCOM. Oh, the power is off. We had it the other day. Switch on the light and, oh, it's load shedding again. The this, this smallest little thing these days causes us great grief and pain. How have people done it for centuries? Who don't, if, if you were to tell half of the people who've lived on this earth in history, ESCOM, they'd say, what? What's ESCOM? If you talk about, ele what's electricity? Many people have survived without these things. But there's one thing we can never survive without. We cannot survive without the love of God. We cannot survive without the love of God. You see, without the love of God, we would have been wiped out the moment, not even Adam's lips, but Eve's lips touched that fruit, and Adam's heart even just desired that fruit. 
Do you want to know how much God loves the world? It's not just about the number of people in the world. Look at his patience and love and kindness to a people who have been nothing but wicked and evil throughout every generation. And God has to put up with us generation after generation after generation after generation. No wonder we are panicking that God might leave us completely. That some people even say, well, oh, good riddance. But you see, God is not like that. God loves. God's love is infinite. God love, God's love for his people is what keeps the world going. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, but not the kind in that song. It's the kind of love from the word of God. It's the kind of love that comes from the creator. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. What we can see here is God is love, but the opposite of that or inverting that is not true. Love is not God. In today's world, people have changed it around to say love is God. God is love, and for them it means love is God. But love is not God. God is love. We read it in the previous verse, verse 7. Love is, so God is love, and love is from God. Love is not God, but love is from God. This almost sounds like John 1, doesn't it? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. It sounds the same, doesn't it? The love, God is love, love is from God. Ah, it almost sounds like there would be a person to represent to us the love of God. Just like the Word in John 1 represents a person. The word of God in a person. The love of God in a person. Who is this person? Verse 9 of 1 John chapter 4. In this the love of God was made manifest among us. God is love. Love is from God. In this the love of God was made manifest. Here we have a revelation of the love of God. That God sent his only son into the world. Wow. God so loved the world that he gave. There is the token. There is the manifestation, the revelation of his love. His, his son. So that from the moment that Jesus was baptized and his ministry began, the father saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. There he is. He's declaring that to the world from the heavens. My son with whom I am well pleased. There he is. Isn't that the hope of the Christian? That God from heaven will say about you and me, there is my son with whom I am well pleased. Isn't that how you get to enter into heaven? Only if God declares to you, my son in whom I am well pleased. Only if God acknowledges you as one of his sons. By the way, that goes for the women as well. You'll be sons of God, full heirs of the grace. You see? Full heirs of the grace of God. In this the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world. So that we might live through him. Let's reflect a bit on this only son. Where did he come from? Where did the son come from? John chapter 6 tells us, Jesus tells us, I am the bread from heaven. He is the bread from heaven. And when you eat of this bread, what happens? You will have eternal life. And what does he mean by eating of the bread in John chapter 6? He means believe in him. He who believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. 
God sends his son from heaven, leaving his throne, leaving heaven, leaving what rightfully belongs to him and where he rules and sits in his glory. Leaving all of that, Jesus Christ, who did not count equality with God, something to be grasped. But what did he do? Philippians 2. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. He humbles himself by taking on the form of a servant. We must note here that in John chapter 4 and 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9, God sent his only son into the world. We oftentimes think that it is God who so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. And we think it's the cross, it's Jesus' death and him on the cross there that's a symbol of God's love. Yes, that's true. But the cross is not the only aspect of the person and work of Jesus Christ. How many people would happily accept the cross without even thinking about what that means? We say that word cross as if it's something wonderful. The cross is something shameful and despised. It's something you wouldn't even mention that you know someone who was crucified if you were a Roman in that day. Because it would be shameful for you to know a criminal who would die on a cross. And yet, and yet, we're called to acknowledge Jesus. Jesus said, who acknowledges me before the world, I will acknowledge before my Father. And it's not acknowledging him in prideful boasting, I know Jesus. It's also being identified with the shame of the cross. The shamefulness of it all. I know a man who was crucified with two murderers. And not just know him. We proclaim that he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Try that one at a dinner party one evening. Ha, 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 ha. Foolishness. Foolishness. You see, there's nothing to be proud of to be a Christian. In the world's eyes, that's a shameful thing. That should cause us a moment to reflect and to pause and to think about this. And to try and understand, but why? Why would God call us to identify with such a shameful thing? Why would God call us to go through the humiliation of, of that? It's precisely because God put himself through the greatest humiliation that he could go through. Jesus Christ came to this world who was his own, not to condemn this world, which he had the full right to do, the full right and the full ability to come to this earth, to crumble it all up and throw it over his shoulder and say, done with this wickedness. But what does he do instead? We must see that Jesus, the Son of God, who he sent into this world, he sent him. He was born of a virgin. How many people despise the virgin birth today? How many academics write paper after paper explaining the impossibility of that? Waste of paper. Save the trees. Don't write it in such nonsense. You must believe in the virgin birth because without the virgin birth you don't believe in the incarnation of Christ if you don't believe in his incarnation you don't believe that he's truly come from heaven if you don't believe he's truly come from heaven you don't have a sufficient savior he can't pay for your sins you of all people like Paul says to the Corinthians are most to be pitied 
if one aspect of what the Bible teaches is false, poor you. Why would we give up one aspect, one aspect of what the Bible teaches to say, well, maybe that's not so true. Why? Why would we ignore something like the virgin birth? Why would we ignore something like the incarnation, his suffering, his humiliation? Why would we only talk about the fluffy, meaningless stuff? You see, it's human nature to rather believe a lie and be comforted by a lie than to face the hard truth, look it in the eye, and trust in God. And the most terrible of all truths to confront is looking in the mirror and knowing worthless sinner. People stop their ears. They say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to think about it. Pastor, don't talk about such things. <coughs> we don't want to hear things like that. But we must. If we're talking about the love of God, what else can we talk about? How else will you understand the love of God if you don't understand that there's nothing about you that's drawing Him to you, that you're so, you're so irresistible? God's love is so beautiful and so magnificent and so glorious precisely because we're so repulsive to Him. It's like the parable of the, of the lost son. You can almost hear the scribes and the Pharisees when Jesus says that the son was in a pigsty and then he comes back to the father's house and now the father gets up and he's running toward the son and he embraces him. You can hear the Pharisees already mumbling. Why didn't he tell him to take a shower first? You see, you see, they couldn't understand the love of God. You see, they thought rules, regulations, you have to earn God's love. You have to earn His love, you have to earn His respect, and then... But you see, God is not like all the other gods. You see, every single God who's ever been invented is one which you need to perform. You need to do a rain dance for the rain to come. You need to say a certain amount of prayers you need you need to do to do to do you need to put in coins in the vending machine god is not a cosmic vending machine where you put in your coins of good works it's not it's not how god works he's a he's a person he's a holy person he's righteous he's just He's loving. In this, the love of God was made manifest. Verse 9, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. We might live through him. And our life is found through God in Christ Jesus precisely because he was incarnate. He had the virgin birth. He suffered on our behalf. He died for our sins, but not only paying the penalty of our sins, but also living the perfect life. Being perfectly righteous and good, fulfilling the law completely. So that when God looks at you, He, just, he do, doesn't just say, Oh, all of your sins have been forgiven and dealt with, so where is the um, money that you owe? Where is the righteousness that you owe? You see, we're in big debt because of our sin. That debt needs to be settled. But when your debt is settled, what do you have to your account still? You have a zero account. It's an illustration. If you want to go to the movies, but you, you owe your parents 12 rand, and the movie costs 12 rand. I know it doesn't cost that these days, but back in my day, it cost 12 rand to go to see a movie. You first have to pay the 12 rand back to your parents, and then you still need 12 rand to pay to the movie. And what does a good parent do? What does God do for us? 
He pays the debt and he pays for the life that's required. He pays it all. So that like the parable in Matthew 18, that your, your sum of money that you owe is forgiven, is not just the sum of money that's forgiven, but also here is some extra for you. To enter into, here is the blessings of heaven. Here's the inheritance of heaven, even. For us who can't even buy anything because we're so spiritually poor. We're worse than poor. We're like when I, when I drive past the robots and the guys beg for money, I tell them, I can't give you money. I still owe money to the bank for this car. I'm poorer than you, in a certain sense. I'm, poor, I'm poorer than you, in a certain sense. If I don't pay the bank, I also sit on the street, but then I still owe the bank that money, and you don't. So, poor old me, do you have some spare change for me? You see? That's how poor we are. Verse 10, and this is love, not that we have loved God. So John reminds the church, and this is love, not that we have loved God. You see, so many Christians today go about saying, I love God so much, I love Jesus so much. Please, before you start telling me how much you love Jesus, before you start telling me about how much you love Jesus, just, just marvel for a bit. And praise with me for a bit how much God loves us, you and me. Just spend a few minutes to just marvel at how much God loves us. Instead of greeting me with a, hi, you, you should know how much I love God. You know, I did this and this in the weekend. Okay, great. Now I know you love God. <laughs> we haven't encouraged one another that God loves us. Greet one another. Isn't it wonderful that we have this day that both of us have breath? breath. What a, what, how great is it to see you? Because we're not guaranteed that we'll see one another next Sunday, are we? It's not a guarantee. It's so wonderful to see you today. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. And that He sent His Son. To be the propitiation for our sins. What does propitiation mean? It's a big word. We've somehow already covered that ground by explaining that. A propitiation for our sins means that it's an offering to appease or to satisfy God's wrath. That is what a propitiation means. Jesus Christ was set forth as a sacrifice to fulfill to satisfy the wrath of God. The holy God must pour out wrath upon your sins for all eternity because of what you have done and what I have done. That's what we deserve. For God, for all eternity, to only pour out wrath upon us. For there only to be a weeping and gnashing of teeth for all of us. And it would not make God unfair if He were to do that with every single person in this world. It wouldn't be unfair. No one would be able, in their weeping and in their gnashing of teeth, say, God, you have been unfair. You've treated me unfairly. None of us would be able to say, God has treated us unfairly. And so God in His free grace in his free sovereign good loving grace toward you and me sets forth his son and pours out his wrath upon Jesus pours out his wrath upon Jesus and here is how great Jesus Christ is he had the wrath of God poured out upon him to the full satisfaction of your sins and mine and all of the people who will ever be in heaven. And he rose from the dead after that. 
He rose from the dead after having the eternal wrath of God poured out upon him. How great is your Jesus? Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus took the wrath for your sins, but not only yours, but for the person sitting next to you and, next, and sitting here with you this evening, and the Christians all over the world? Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. He took all of the wrath of God upon him to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, whose sins have the wrath of God been poured out upon? Yours and mine. Again, the truth stands. God does not sacrifice his character. He does not sacrifice his goodness, his holiness, his justice. He sacrifices his son. He comes to die in our place. God becomes a man so that he may avert his own wrath. You see, the only one who's able to withhold God and hold him back in his wrath and say, no, have mercy upon them, is God himself. That's why we need Jesus Christ to stand in front of his father where he is seated at the right hand. So you see, God gave his son to the world. And even in him ascending to heaven is not God withdrawing his gift from us. It's not God taking his gift away. It's God bringing that gift to completion and, and continuing to bring it to fruition. Because Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And like John wrote in the second chapter, we have an advocate with the Father. We have Jesus representing us in heaven. And we have the helper, the Holy Spirit, representing us here with us. So that Jesus is with his Father and saying, I paid it all. The wrath, it's done. When we've sinned and when we come and repent and say and forgive, forgive us our sin. Jesus steps in and says, Father, forgive. Your wrath has been appeased. My death paid for that forgiveness. You see, what does it cost God to forgive you? It cost him his son. His forgiveness is not cheap it's free it's free he gives it freely but not does not come cheap he paid a price for that the thing that God wants from you and from me is to value the price that he's paid do we value the person do we value Jesus Christ whom he has sent We must take note in Hebrews chapter 10. Here is the warning and I will close with this. And note that this warning in Hebrews 10 is given for the church. It's given to the people of God. Hebrews 10 and verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. If you've ever been touched by a sermon, by the proclamation of the word, and you understand something of the love of God and what it cost him to pay for your sins and to forgive your sins, and you've come to a realization of the great cost and the great love, and that causes you to be repulsed by God, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving such knowledge, if we are unmoved by this love that is declared to us, there remains no longer a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment. If you do not accept 
And if you are not moved to love and to joy by Christ taking the wrath of God that was meant for your sins upon his son, Jesus Christ, if you spurn that gift, the only thing you can expect is that God will pour out his eternal wrath upon you personally. And a fury of fire that will, be cons will consume the adversaries. You see, then you're not a child of God. Then you're an adversary. Verse 28, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So if you were to disobey the law of Moses, two or three witnesses witnessing against you, you would be put to death. But how much worse will the punishment be? Do you think, do you think, so the writer of Hebrews invites his audience, he invites us to think about this. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God? How many witnesses do you think God needs? Only himself. He looks you in the eyes and discerns whether or not you sincerely love his son or not. You have to look God in the face and try and convince him that you really love his son. That should lead us to fear and reverence, shouldn't it? How much worse a punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? You see, you've come against the Father, against the Son, and against the Holy Spirit. Verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. You see, many Christians today think God won't judge the Christian. If I ask Christians today, will you face God on judgment day? Many Christians say, no, there is now no judgment for those who are in Christ. And then I say, which verse is that? Then they don't know, then I have to tell them it's Romans 8. And then we go to Romans 8, and then I say, what does it say? There is now no judgment for those who are in Christ. And then they say, no, no, that's not judgment. It says condemnation. I say, oh, okay. What about judgment? Well, there'll be judgment. And the judgment will either be condemnation. Or what's the English for Freisprach? I can't remember it now. Innocent. Declaration of innocence. The verdict delivered, innocent, or condemnation. You're either free to go, or you're not free to go. But you'll have to pass God on Judgment Day. You'll have to pass Jesus Christ. And that goes for the Christian as well as the non-Christian. All of us will face God on Judgment Day. We don't become Christians so that we don't have to face God on Judgment Day. We become Christian in one sense and we come to church regularly so that we're not frightened in our boots when we do face God on Judgment Day. Because we stomach preaching like this week after week telling us that we'll face God on Judgment Day. Isn't it? We want to get used to dealing with our sins openly and honestly and sincerely before our God. And beloved church, one thing I want you all to understand and know. God deals with your heart primarily through the preaching of his word from a pulpit. I had to speak to pastors in this week who thought that their counseling one-on-one -on -one with people is equal Equally, the word of God is when they preach it from the pulpit. I had to say, brothers, sincerely, no. Sincerely, no. And, and this comes back to the introduction of the, the sermon. God works through the preaching of his word, even if the church is empty and only a few souls are there. 
Because it's the powerfulness of his word through the preaching. How will they believe if they don't hear? How will they hear if no one preaches? Not if someone does not tell them in a private room or in a counseling room. Preaching. Preaching. Declaring the word of God by the spirit of God. And then the closing verse, Hebrews 10 verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Back to 1 John 4 and verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, you see, we, we had to talk about the wrath of God. We had to talk about our sin. But come to understand the greatness of God's love for you in overcoming that sin. You, you can approach him freely and say all of those wicked things that have come to your mind while I'm preaching, all of those things that you are guilty of, acknowledge it. Guilty, Lord. Guilty. Please deal with that sin. I often challenge Christians. How will you plead? Confession is nothing else but pleading guilty to all charges. Guilty, guilty, guilty. How do you plead when your prayers? When your conscience tells you you've done something against God, how do you plead? Do you try and wash your conscience clean by yourself? Or do you plead guilty? Help me. Wash me, Lord. Like David prayed in Psalm 51. Please do not take your spirit from me. Please, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. Cleanse me. Make me clean. Then I'll be whiter than snow. Cleanse me from my wickedness and sin and be confident that God is willing to do that. How do you know God is willing to wash your sins? Well, Jesus died 2,000 years ago so that God may forgive your sins today. And how that, do you know that God's patience has not run out? Well, here we are, aren't we? Count the patience of the Lord as salvation. Count the patience of the Lord as salvation. How many more people will be born again tomorrow? How many more Christians will be a little bit more sanctified tomorrow than they were today? How many young people will come to Christ in the next day? How many of them will have hopes kindled? How many of them will go on to get married and have children? How many of them will get to grow up and be grandfathers and grandmothers? It's in the Lord's hands. We don't know. But wouldn't it be wonderful if God would be with us, with our children, and with our children's children, and with our children's children, until Jesus comes? And we can have that confidence, can't we? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We thank you that your righteous standard never changes. We thank you that you perfectly keep a record of all our sins. Not so that you may turn it against us, O Lord, but that you may pay the price and that no one at any time may come and say the price has not been paid. So that anyone who comes with an accusation against us, that anyone who comes demanding payment, you may say and we may with confidence know that you have paid the price for every single sin. You have dealt with it perfectly, completely. Father, we pray that as we come to the light of that knowledge that you have done this for us, that we would also be moved to do this for one another, to forgive one another, not to hold any sins against one another, but that we may stir one another up to godliness, stir one another up to holiness, to sanctification, to love and good works. Not because we think that we have somehow earned heaven and we want others to also earn heaven, but precisely because we have been given the inheritance of heaven. We've been given it freely. 
And so may we look at one another as Christians and say, my brother in Christ, my sister in Christ, we are free. We are free from the penalty of sin. We are free from the guilt of sin. May the Lord deliver us from the power of sin and continue to do so day after day. Father, help us. Encourage us and call us that we may come to you confessing our sins and repenting. Work that repentance and faith in our hearts. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen.